Good evening. The School Committee Workshop Business Session of March 11th, 2024 will now come to order. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Ryan DeZoglio? Yeah, uh, present. Lori Keegan? Present. Kristen Maxwell? Present. Daniel Shabilia? Present. Kenneth Willette? Present. May and Neil Perry? Mayor Neil Perry. Did you hear? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to accept the agenda as presented? So, so moved. moved. Second. Moved by Member Shabilia, second by Member Willette. Ch yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willette? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Yes. Superintendent, would you please introduce our student for tonight's flag salute? I would love to. I'd like to call up Finn McMiniman up to the podium. And we have, I believe, Mr. Reeve and Mrs. Lamoureux here and family uh, for the flag salute today, fourth grader from the Timoney. Um, good evening. I am proud to present Finn McManaman to lead the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Finn is a fourth grader in Miss Tully's class who was also here to see Finn. He lives with his mom and dad, Kara and Tom, his brother Noah, who is an eighth grader at the Chimney, his grandmother and the family's golden retrievers, Max and Scout. Finn has attended the Timoney Grammar School since kindergarten, where his mom is a school resource officer. While it can be convenient to have a parent in the building, Finn also finds it hard because his friends can easily rat him out when he makes the occasional unwise choice, as all children do. His favorite things about Chimney are the great teachers, being with good friends, wellness class, and fun Fridays. Finn likes reading and is a fan of the Hank Zipser book series by Henry Winkler, the Humphrey Hamster series by Betty Burney, and he is currently reading Falling Short, and you might have finished that by now by Ernesto Cisneros. As you can tell from this book selection, Finn has a great sense of humor and a positive attitude. Ms. Tully and Mrs. Gallant, his third grade teacher, offered the following thoughts. Finn is a fun, charismatic young man. He loves to play and watch sports like football, basketball, and boxing. Finn also works hard with his academics, recently getting an above standard on his Southeast test. No matter where he goes, he can always find a friend. Finn, Finn is a great friend, always willing to help on the playground or in the classroom. I love having Finn in my class, especially our conversations waiting for the bus. We'll talk about that. Uh, and Mrs. Gallant says, Finn was one of the shining stars of our classroom. He has a determined will and a love for learning. His optimistic spirit and his positive attitude were a model for others to see how you could work through your challenges to improve your skills. Finn displayed a tick charge attitude and enjoyed the times when he got to lead the class. His cheerful, silly nature was contagious, often making us smile and laugh. In his spare time, Finn enjoys playing video games and eating his favorite foods, which are bacon and nitro takis, hopefully not at the same time. He plays basketball, flag football, and his favorite, lacrosse, which keeps his parents busy. He loves to travel with his family, especially to the beautiful beaches and clear waters of the Bahamas, which he said is his favorite. But Disney World is also a frequent vacation spot. In the future, Finn is considering a career in the military, possibly as an Air Force pilot or Navy SEAL, both of which are admirable goals and require a lot of hard work. He might consider a second career in law enforcement like his parents, but he'll wait and see how he feels at the time. Finn is looking forward to having some new specials in upper school next year, but I think he's feeling a little sentimental about leaving lower school. I know that I am going to miss seeing him wear shorts to school every day, regardless of the temperature, without any complaints of being cold. I amazes me. It is a pleasure to have Finn represent our school in leading the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Please stand. I, hand over. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
<laughs> Superintendent, would you please introduce our SOAR Award recipient? Again, it would be my pleasure. I'd like to have Laura Enright join us. She's the World Language Department Chair and student Kimberly Vasquez to join her up at the podium tonight. Good evening. The World Language Department is extremely proud to present Kimberly Natareño Vasquez as our 2024 SOAR Award winner for her commitment and achievements in Spanish and the community at large. Over her four years at MHS, Kimberly has tackled the challenge of a demanding honors and AP course load. She has maintained a 4.291 GPA overall and a 4.67 GPA in her Spanish coursework. She completed our Heritage Speaker Program in two years, passed the AP Language Exam with a five, and earned or is qualified to earn the Seal of Biliteracy with distinction by her junior year. Her AP teacher, Tracy McNichols, shares that the first words that come to mind when I think of her are inquisitive, open-minded, and focused. She has developed a growth mindset that prompted her to increase the level of her advanced coursework and also enjoy the numerous opportunities that Methuen High School offers. She enjoyed her heritage learner programs but also flourished in history classes because, as she noted, learning from mistakes leads to a more tolerant world. Following graduation, Kimberly plans to pursue a degree in pre-law and hopefully a minor in Spanish as she continues her studies at the undergraduate level. Beyond her academic achievements, Kimberly is truly committed to enriching Methuen High School and her community as a whole. She is a natural leader, and even with her demanding academic schedule, makes time for Adopt-A-Grandparent, Key Club, Film and Video Club, and working with children at St. Mary's Church. She is also our Spanish Club president, and most recently, an outstanding Master of Ceremonies at our Quinceanera Ball. Maria Figuereo, the Spanish Club advisor, had this to share. Kim was dedicated to making the Quinceanera Ball happen this year. As president of the Spanish Club, she demonstrates her communication skills and displays her talents in bringing out the best in others. Kimberly is also a member of the National Honor Society and a representative to the Massachusetts State Student Advisory Council. For all these reasons and more, Kimberly is held in in the highest regard by Methuen High School faculty uh, for her genuine passion and commitment to learning, self-improvement, and community service. And so it was with great pleasure that we honor her as our SOAR Award recipient tonight. Um, I just wanted to thank my parents and everybody here tonight, Ms. Enright, Ms. Figuereo, and Ms. McNichols. Thank you.
veteran essayist is not available this evening. So, Superintendent, would you please introduce the BIPOC African Americans and the arts presentation? Yes, yeah, so I, I want to, yep, come on up. I want to welcome Ya and her uh, peer to come on up and to share with you their BIPOC presentation that they did at City Hall last month for Black History Month. Is it green, the light? Hi, my name is Crystal Castro and I'm a junior here at MHS. I've been a part of the BIPOC club since my freshman year and I became an officer last year. Hi, my name is Ya. I'm a senior at Methuen High School and I've been a part of BIPOC since sophomore year and I became an officer this year. Um, this year, BIPOC has collaborated with the Adopt a Grandparent Club to hold a Black History Month celebration and a viewing of the color purple. And we also held our Lunch and Learn at Methuen City Hall and presented our Black History Month African American, African Americans in the Arts presentation. This year's Black History Month focused on the art of resistance and how black trailblazers revolutionized their fields by pioneering new, new techniques in music, visual arts, and poetry. And we really wanted to hone in on how art has been used historically to preserve underrepresented stories. For example, during the Harlem Renaissance, which was an intellectual and cultural revival of African American music and dance and art in Harlem, New York in the 1920s, um, poetry became a big mm, mode to resist oppression. Um, Claude McKay is a, was a Jamaican writer and poet born in September of 1890, who passed away in May of 1948. He paved the way during the Harlem Renaissance for um, poets to discuss race, racism in poetry. And one of his most notable poems were If We Must Die. Here is what it is. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us through dead. O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Visual arts was also a really um, key, uh, sorry. Thank you. Um, visual arts is also a key factor in um, resisting oppression um, within the black community. Neo-expressionism is an example of this. It developed as a reaction against conceptual um, and minimal art during the 1970s. It portrayed recognizable objects in a rough and emotional way using vivid colors and it was used um, by social activists to combat oppressive practices. Jean-Michel Basquiat was a contemporary artist born December 1960 in Brooklyn, New York, and sadly passed away August of 1988. Um, he started out as a graffiti artist and used symbols and interpretations to showcase themes such as racism, classism, and colonial, colonialism through art. Thank you. Yeah, we're wondering if there's any updates for the committee. Um, there is a small update. Uh, next week, we are having a school spirit week. The theme is decades week, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone dress up and show their school spirit. So thank you. Thank you. Student Advisory Committee is not present tonight. Um, may I have a motion and a second to approve the MHS J. Rotsi to attend <coughs> the Army Academic Bowl Championship? So moved. So moved. Moved by M Member DeZoglio, 
seconded by the mayor. Um, yes, discussion. I'm going to ask uh, Tim Flaherty. I flatter. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Doctor. It's, it's been a long it's day. Okay. When I, to come on up and yeah. to, and talk about the program. Perfect. Is this on? Flaherty. Yeah. Oh. That's how it works. Okay, you got to be five percent smarter than the equipment you're working with, I guess. Yeah, don't don't worry about mispronouncing the name. In the army, everyone left off the O, and I was like, oh, I can get out of this deployment. They think it's a flarity. Anyway, so uh, good evening, everybody. I'm really um, I'm I'm honored to be here. I was not expecting this, first of all. So I'm very uh, grateful that uh, you're taking time out of your busy schedules to to hear the uh, proposal. A um, little bit of background, we. Through the spring semester, we do this thing called MAP, and it's our marksmanship, our athletic, and our, uh, our physical fitness contests in which we compete across what's called Comal Second Brigade all across uh, basically New England. And uh, I was as surprised as all you were. I've been pushing my cadets, and we were honored. And uh, we, we were actually placed. And uh, because of its accomplishments during these winter competitions, the United States Army Cadet Command has invited the Methuen High School's JRTC academic team to participate in this year's annual 2024 Army JRTC Academic Bowl Championship. Now, this event is a great honor for our cadets. I, I, I cannot stress that enough. Um, and will take place on the campus of Catholic University uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, who goes? We're only authorized to bring four cadets. Um, and with the appropriate chaperones. Myself, um, for the male JROTC cadets, of which I'll have two. And I also have enlisted the assistance of my colleague, Sergeant First Class Bell. She's one of the JROTC assistant instructors from Lawrence High School. In fact, I spoke with her this weekend about it. And she's got permission from her school to accompany as our female chaperone. Now, for safety reasons, all cadets and cadres stay in gender segregated dorms on the Catholic University campus uh, we arrive and register no later than 5 p.m. on Friday, June 21st, and we depart the following Tuesday morning on the 25th at 10 a.m. sharp. Our mode of transportation will be a minivan rental capable of transporting myself, Sergeant First Class Bell, and most importantly, our cadets to and from this event. The United States Army Cadet Command will bear the cost of the rental vehicle to include all other competition costs, lodging, and meals. In other words, it won't cost our district anything. If the school board gives its permission to attend, I must register our JROTC cadets no later than close of business March 31st, 2023 of this month. For safety purposes, the JROTC Academic Bowl registration must include the following. Full names of all the participants as stated on their official school IDs, the birth dates of all the attendees, any dietary and or medical restrictions of the attendees, mobile numbers of all the adult members and or chaperones, signed photo releases, medical releases, code forms for each cadet and adult, and travel preferences. The reason why we need the photo release is this thing's going to be ta uh, uh, broadcast nationally. The official competition starts officially after the completion of Saturday and Sunday morning preliminary rounds on Sunday, June 23rd at 4 p.m., followed by the Joint Service Academic Bowl immediately following the Army Championship at 5 p.m. on Sunday. The winning team for the Army JROTC will then face off and compete against the Air Force, the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps JROTC programs in a four-way competition. Please note that the championship and other evening programs will be live streamed until, uh, oh, I guess a winner is declared. Let me get my place here. So that other members of the, of the um, Methuen Public School and their families in the district can watch the MHS cadets uh, compete. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kwong, school committee, and members uh, for considering this proposal. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member Dezoglio. Thank you, um, Madam Vice Chair, as of right now. Um, so um, I just want to say thank you for your presentation. And as a cadet here for four years under the Colonel Stansberry, um, I just want, like, this is a great opportunity for the cadets. Um, I wish we had those competitions we had, like, in state, but to go to nationals. Uh, this is a great opportunity for our cadets. So you will have my full support. Thank you. 
All right, can we get a roll call vote, please, Martha? Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Krista Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Ouellette? Yes. May Neil Perry? Emphatically, yes. Unanimous. That's great, right. thank you. Be inappropriate to say beat Navy? Yeah, is that how that works? Oh, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. We have two people signed up for public participation. Um, one is an email and one is a is present here today. Would Jade Jalbert like to come up and state your name and address? Hey guys. Uh. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jay Jelbert. My address is 6 Lady Slipper Lane. Um, I'm here to speak to you about some items that were on the agenda in past meetings that I just don't want forgotten about. Um, the first is school libraries. This was discussed at the January 23rd meeting. Uh, to me, the, meet, the discussion was less than satisfactory. It seemed like this project was going to start off underfunded and understaffed. Um, there was talk at that, uh, at that January meeting about getting student input, how to stock the libraries. There's so much new material since they closed in 2020 that just pulling them out isn't, pulling out the old books isn't gonna work, and how to fund them. Um, if you wouldn't allow uncertified teachers, why would it even be considered to open a library without at least one cert certified librarian at each location? Well, I re realize these discussions take time, and I am cons <laughs> sorry. While I realize these discussions take time, I will say I'm concerned about the fact that I've heard nothing from the committee since that meeting in January. I'm, hopefully, I'm hopeful that it is still a priority to this committee. Fun in schools. This was recently discussed as Valentine's Day. Um, I realize that holiday is over. That holiday, it's not a real holiday. That holiday is over, but it's annual, as is Halloween. Um, I use these as markers for just how much fun has been eliminated in the school over the years. Um, the most recent thing that we had around Valentine's Day was Spirit Week. The, I brought copies of the Spirit Week um, dress up for each day. The first day was wear polka dot stripes or patterns. In other words, wear clothes. The second was wear sweats or a hoodie. Everyday wear. Wear red and do not bring in cards. Wear your best smile and dress like an inspirational or influential person, person days. You'll note there's no fun, there's no inspiration, nothing out of the ordinary. Even the hero day didn't say dress like a superhero, it said dress like a person. The one day where something specific was asked, wear red, it was followed by a negative, don't bring in cards. No, it wasn't worded like that, it was worded nicely. Um, I am pro fun in schools, I'm pro f making schools the kind of place kids want to be, not one where I have to drag them out of bed to go every single day. Will most days be mundane? Absolutely. However, there are so many lessons that can be incorporated in making the school day fun. If you don't want kids to celebrate Valentine's Day, why not teach them what an actual heart looks like and what the difference is between the representation that we see and have them design a card based on a heart, an actual human heart. That's a lesson. It has nothing about St. Valentine's in there. By the way, I hate Valentine's Day. I'm just gonna throw that out there right now, hate it. Um, the next thing is the dress code. Um, I had planned to note how great the weather has been, but you know, it's New England, and hey, that slapped me in the face today. Um, but it is March, and spring is nearly here. In the beginning of the year, one of my children was chastised in front of her grade for showing off a sliver of her stomach. After some confusion over tank tops and whether or not they are allowed, my child asked me point blank, and this is a direct quote, why does my belly button, what does my belly button have to do with anybody's education? And so before spring comes, and this is an issue is upon us again, I pose the same question to you. What does a child's midsection have to do with any student or teacher's ability to do what they need to do in school? Why is that even part of the policy? I would appreciate the, the school committee looking into this policy yet again. I know that it has been looked at in the past and recently in the past. I would also like the committee to figure out a way to uphold the first part of the policy. 
All students should be able to dress comfortably for school without fear of or actual unnecessary discipline or body shaming. I can tell you with 100% certainty, this was not my daughter's experience. She, in fact, came home from school and said she was called out in front of the entire grade. My daughter does exaggerate quite a bit. My cooking is not actually killing her. This experience has been told to me time and time again from many students and many parents. It's not okay. Bullying and fighting. This is gonna take some time because I wrote it down and now I'm switching all around. Um, this was discussed, fighting was discussed a few years ago and I was, a few, sorry, meetings ago and um, I was shocked to learn that a fight is when only, when both parties are physically involved, not when it's just one. Um, I recently learned that one of my children has been the target of a group of bullies for more than one school year. There have been physical threats, bullying, harassing messages, and derogatory comments all reported to both staff and administration. When a child stood up for themselves, after the staff and administration did nothing, they were punished while the aggressor was not. When it was brought to the administration's attention, lunch seats were assigned. That's it. So what is done to the constant bullies when their aggression is only mental and or emotional, which is also huge, or when the target does not fight back? Besides being swept under the rug and having a single anti-bullying enrichment program which is not followed up in any way. This is ongoing in my child's school and other schools that I've heard of, all in Methuen. I have a lot to say, but I know that the time is limited. Um, as one of my friends said, I have eight and a half children and they all have stuff to do, so I do have to leave. Um, I appreciate your time and I do hope that this is all taken under advisement and listened to. So thank you all for your time this evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Alyssa Carcenaro um, with no address for public participation. Good evening, my name is Alyssa Car Carcenaro. I'm a graduate of Methuen Public Schools, a teacher in a neighboring community, and will have a kindergartner at, at the Timoney in the fall. I have seen all over social media the outcry and disappointment that many families feel regarding the lack of celebrations at MPS. I am here to echo the sentiment and how frustrating it is to hear of a community that I love and specifically moved back to has essentially eliminated anything fun for our children. As an educator myself, I find this so disheartening. We constantly complain about how children grow up so fast, especially in a time of social media and so many influences, yet as an entire district and the decision has been made to eliminate any way to make school fun or any way to make kids feel like kids. I have heard a lot about how the district continues to cater to the one, the single child or family who may be upset by these celebrations. The reality is that every, every and all celebrations can be optional. There is a way to cater to all children. If you look at communities made up of the same demographics and socioeconomic, we Methuen, these communities allow these celebrations. They allow kids to be kids. Please consider f figuring out how to allow these things in schools. I worry that we will continue to lose families to private schools and other options because they still allow their kids to be kids. I don't wanna be one of those families. I hope you take this email as well as other parents' concerns into consideration to make changes to the district. We all want our, chil our students to still have the opportunities to be kids. They deserve that. Sincerely, Alyssa Carcenaro. At this time, we will close public participation. Madam Vice Chair? Yes. If I could for a minute, please. Um, I, I struggle with it. I'd like the committee to join me in taking a moment, moment of silence, please. Um, this past week, we lost a very prominent Methuen resident uh, who he and his wife have been all about Methuen since the day they, they moved to Methuen. And so um, uh, we lost Alan McClennan, who's a big supporter for scholarship funds, whose wife Janet is a real estate agent who, who supports all of these initiatives in our public schools, in our you know, Arlington neighborhood. Uh, they're just tremendous folks. And he passed away um, March 8th, 
Uh, please join me in a moment of silence, if you would. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you cannot make the meeting in person for public participation, you can send an email to Martha Sorois at masorois at methuen.k12.ma.us before 3 p.m. on the day of the school committee meeting. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of October 10th, 2023? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Willette, second by Member Shabilia. Discussion? I need a roll call vote, Martha. Mm -hmm. Can we just both do them so we can only do one roll call vote? Oh. Member Shabilia. Oh, Martha, are we able to do them all as one batch so we can roll call vote them once instead of doing eight of them? Sure. No. I, I, we, no, we, we've, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that that quickly, but. <laughs> okay. Um, we should not vote on them all together as a batch because there were different people attending and some people not present and there might be some, an error on one and not the other. We've always put them so that you do a vote on each one in case of those issues. I do know that we might have an issue tonight with the same issue we had last time. So. We're invoking the rule of necessity. Correct. Yes. Yes. So that might have to happen. I'm not sure how that happens. We just evoke the rule of necessity. Yeah, rule of so I don't okay. Now it's a magic wand as do we just that. do it. Yeah. So someone needs to. Because we don't have the members here for a quorum for the first five. Um, I think it was the first five, right, Martha? I think yes. if we, we just don't have identify the... this as under the rule of necessity. Okay. Does that have to be voted on or that's yeah, just? I think you have to vote on it. We'll vote. Right. Invoking the rule of necessity as a motion. Yeah. Second. Right. Roll call. Roll yeah, call. Roll call, roll call, please. Uh, just cover the I'm basis. sorry, who second that? I, uh, uh, Member Zazoglio. Thank you. Brian Zazoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Krista Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shavilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Yes. Um, so now we need a roll call vote on October 23rd, 2023. Oh, I'm sorry, October 10th, 2023. I apologize. So moved. Second. We already have this. Oh, yeah, we, we already did it. We just need now. the roll call. Yep. A roll call for all of them, is that mm -hmm. um, For October 10th. Oh, okay, so we're not doing it. All right. Brian DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Present. Right? Or right. Because I, I wasn't here. Right, but I'm not sure where you invoked. The, We've invoked. Uh, that you can vote yes. Then no, I'm, I'm going to vote no. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Present. Four yeses. I don't understand that. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of October 2023? Um, I'm sorry, October 23rd, 2023. So moved. Moved by. Member Willett. Second. Second by Member DiZoglio. Ryan DiZoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Present. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Present. Passes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of November 13th, 2023? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Willett, second by Member DiZoglio. And roll call. Brian DiZoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Present. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of November 27th, 2023? So moved. Moved by Member Willett. 
Second. Second by Member DiZaglio. Brian DiZaglio. Yes. Lori Keegan. Kristen Maxwell. Present. Daniel Shabilia. Yes. Kenneth Ouellette. Yes. May Neil Perry. Yes. Passes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of December 11th, 2023? So moved. Moved by Member DiZaglio. Second. Second by Member Shabilia. Any discussion? Brian DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Present. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Roulette? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of January 10th, 2024? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Willette, second by Member DiZaglio. Discussion? Ryan DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willette? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of January 22nd, 2024? So moved. Moved by Member Willette. Second. Second by Member Shabilia. Any discussion? Roll call. Brian DiZaglio. I am a vote present. Okay. Lori Keegan. Yes. Kristen Maxwell. Yes. Daniel Shabilia. Yes. Kenneth Willette. Yes. May Neil Perry. Yes. Passes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of February 12th, 2024? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Willette, second by Member Shabilia. Discussion? Ryan DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willette? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. Passes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of February 26, 2024? So moved. Second. second. Moved by Member Willette, second by Member DiZaglio. Discussion? Brian DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willette? Yes. May and Neil Perry? Yes. Superintendent, would you please start the discussion on the fiscal year 25 budget update? Yes, thank you. Um, so in your packet, there's a, a memo and there's a couple of different pieces to this, so I'll go through this. Um, there's not a great level of detail. This is mostly an overview to set the stage for our budget preparation conversations in April. Um, and also uh, just a, sort of a fresh reminder of how uh, the budget is generated, uh, what comes from the state, what comes from the city, and what our role is in the next uh, couple of months here as we go through the budget process. So um, just on the front page there, are three pretty critical factors when we're talking about our school-based budget, a foundation budget, the Chapter 70 program, which is the highlight there, the Chapter 70 aid is what we're looking for for how much the state is going to uh, provide for Methuen Public Schools uh, school operating budget. Um, and that is based on the foundation budget, which is the top part of this, based on. Uh, all of that is based on, and some of you may have heard me say this uh, time and time again, but our October 1st enrollment. So our October 1st, <clears throat> excuse me, enrollment of October 1, 2023 dictates what our uh, chapter 78, what our foundation budget will be for the following fiscal year. So if you, re Re, if you do recall, uh, last year we were challenged and we're continuously challenged by the fact that we had an influx of families at the days in. All of that happened after October 1st. So the state, none of those students were uh, accounted for in our October 1st enrollment numbers for the previous school year. So the state has continuously supported us financially in giving us funds for those students because they were not part of our budget and part of our Chapter 78. So we have been very fortunate that way. Uh, I know the mayor will comment the city has not received the kind of funding that the schools have received for the students uh, that we have uh, enrolled in Methuen. 
and uh, I know we've had these conversations with Ms. Bozak's uh, memos updating you as well on the homeless families, so there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and the third uh, large priority for us that you'll hear us talk about uh, in the coming weeks as we prepare the budget is the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is an account specifically designed to reimburse school districts for a proportion of their uh, special education costs. And it's a very defined number that the state sets on what that return will be. Uh, we are always looking for uh, the highest percentage of reimbursement. Right now it is at 75%, so that's what we will prepare our budget for. Uh, so you'll see some of that. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail as we present our budget. Um, but that is an account that we can actually carry forward uh, year to year a certain amount. And again, when we get into the budget, Mr. Gosman will explain that as we start seeing those different pockets of money in the budget reports when we go through what we are um, what we are projecting, what we are budgeting, how much we have in the circuit breaker, how much we will carry forward next year, how much we are allowed to carry forward, what we can use to offset the budget um, for out of district tuitions and any contracted services. So those three, uh, again, highlighted, there's some links there that might help if you have questions. I would certainly say uh, for any member, new or returning members, if there's questions about the budget, any of the information in here to certainly reach out to uh, Mr. Goslin or myself with questions. Uh, it's, it's a complicated process and we don't calculate the numbers. Uh, we trust the state to calculate the numbers for us uh, so we can present, present those to you. So the other piece that is really important that you're gonna hear us talk about and we'll be presenting to all of you the next uh, workshop meeting is the Student Opportunity Act. So five years ago in 2019, legislation was passed uh, called the Student Opportunity Act that uh, put, set forth a six-year plan to recalculate the foundation budget formula. And I hope I'm saying all this right. Mr. Gosden will, will look at me if, I, if I'm not saying all this right, but uh, we have said this a lot in the past five years, so I do think I have a pretty good handle on this. Um, but the Student Opportunity Act uh, really was a recalculation uh, to support the most underfunded districts, which are primarily your gateway cities. So the foundation formula now states that, that English learners, low-income students will get an additional amount of funds to support uh, their needs in school because they do come with a lot um, a lot of additional support needed when they're in school than our non-English speaking students and often our non-low income students. And so uh, what we have seen, the, the legislation also states very clearly that this was gonna take full effect, full implementation would happen over a course of seven years. Uh, COVID messed that up a little bit so we've got six years, 2027, we will see full implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. So right now, uh, the governor has touted that she has fully funded four-sixths of the Student Opportunity Act of what she was supposed to fund by law, which is true. All right, so, so we'll talk about that in a second. But so, so with the Student Opportunity Act comes um, some different levels of accountability through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and also school districts, right, all the way up. So when it first came out, we were, we were um, tasked with providing a three-year Student Opportunity Act plan that said you're gonna get additional funds, how are you going to spend those funds uh, in what categories that are very targeted. This isn't just us decision, we can decide how we're gonna spend those monies. It is how are you gonna focus your attention on your lowest performing students who are um, also in the category of English learners, multi-language learners, low income, uh, special education is also a subgroup that has a high focus. So this isn't just us getting to choose, there's a very set um, 
format and a very uh, distinguished set of rules that we have to follow to create these SOA plans, more so this year than the first year we did it. Um, so again, Dr. Glavsky and I are working on that right now. We're presenting that plan for feedback to school councils over the next two weeks uh, and district teams, uh, school-based teams, and then we'll be presenting that whole plan to you all uh, at the March workshop meeting. Um, that is something that we are required to present to you. Uh, I'm required to also send in the minutes from the meeting that there was an official vote taken before we submit it to the state this spring. So we'll go through that whole process then. Um, so the, the good news is that I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take your eyes to the chart with the red bars. So, the governor's budget typically comes out at the end of January, which it did this year. Uh, and so uh, we have folks all over the state who are you know, doing analyses to determine what the governor's budget means. In my time here in Methuen, definitely as superintendent, uh, I have not seen our budget change from the governor's budget, even though it goes through the process. It goes through the House, the Senate, um, the Joint Committee. I, we just haven't seen much change to our our budget. So we uh, always plan our budget based on the governor's numbers. If it goes higher, that's great, right? We have we have places to move in the budget. Um, again, it's just not something we've experienced. So we will always plan our budget based on what the chapter 70 numbers are based on the governor's budget in January. It's really the only target that we have that is concrete at this time. So what happened this year is that uh, when we were initially told and learned about the Student Opportunity Act uh, for urban districts like ours, is that we would see a linear projection uh, increase over the six years until it started to plateau with funding as we were fully funded by the Student Opportunity Act. So this chart here in red is, a, is really a true indication of what Methuen has experienced uh, in the past three years. Uh, we did see, uh, although this isn't Methuen, so let me just preface, the red chart you're looking at is, is the whole state, not just Methuen, but it really could, I could actually just implant this and have it be um, Methuen's, uh, what we've experienced. So year one, we received a slight increase over the previous year's Chapter 70 aid, uh, which was great. It wasn't a huge, you know, we couldn't make huge gains in any particular area. It wasn't significant enough to uh, add a lot of staff, uh, think about programming differently, materials, instruction. Uh, year one, again, was a nice uh, bump for us, but wasn't quite as significant as years two and three. Uh, years two and three of implementation of the Student Opportunity Act, um, as I indicated, which is a summary from Roger Hatch. He is a financial analyst with the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, so that's where this information is coming from, his analysis that we get very quickly uh, from the state level, which is great. Um, you can see there that the, the, the real issue with what's happening is that the foundation budget uh, has been set based on an inflation rate that the state sets. And DESE cannot change that inflation rate. Um, so what we were promised four years ago with the Student Opportunity Act was this you know, incremental increase for seven years until we plateaued, um, basically that we were finally given the funds from the state that could help serve our population. Uh, that did not happen this year. And the sole reason why is because the inflation rate was set at 1.35%. Um, and uh, in the previous years was capped, it was set at the highest amount that they set it, which was 4.5%, even though the inflation rate was even higher than that. So there's some argument right now about what's happening with the fact that the last two years that formula was capped with that inflation rate, even though the actual inflation rate in the state was higher. Right, so we have a lot of people advocating right now for this uh, and having this be a problem because the inconsistency that it is causing us is, is not how this was presented to us when the SOA legislation was communicated, passed, and how it would support urban districts 
over the course of time and really give us the funds we need to support our students. So those, those light red bars uh, are exactly what's happening. Last, in 2023, we received just under, it was about $7 million increase, $7.5 million increase over the previous year. Last year, we saw just about $8 million increase, oh, that's in the next chart, uh, over 22, uh, I'm sorry, in 23. So this year, uh, we were expecting it to, again, continuously, incrementally go up. So we were expecting it to be somewhere between eight and nine million over last year, uh, that linear projection upward. And as you can see by the next chart on the next page, uh, our chapter 70 increase, while it increased, so I don't want to miss, I just don't want to misrepresent this, it did increase over last year. It increased by $3.8 million, uh, which is a significant drop in what the expectation was. Am I making sense to everybody? All right, so, so while we're very happy of the increase, right, we're always happy to get an increase, that increase does not hold with even level funding what our current budget budget is, carrying it all forward, uh, you know, contractual obligations, the amount of aid uh, didn't come this year to, for us to be able to significantly do the work and continue to do the work that we're doing. Um, so this year, uh, there's just a lot more conversation that we have to have and calculations of how is the city then, uh, the city contribution gonna make up that difference, which is astronomical, right? So how, how are we going to build the budget this year that is gonna be fiscally responsible, but also not go backwards in this district, which is a huge concern of mine, because the past five years we have spent so much time and energy making sure that we have really good class sizes and core academic subjects district-wide, which we do. It's around 20 in, across the board. Uh, in our core academic subjects at the high school level and the grammar schools, less than that in, in some of our K-2 classrooms, right? We have support staff that we need in special education and English learner um, staffing, uh, which we weren't able to provide. We also have the staff that we uh, have increased over the past four years in our guidance and school mental health. So we've, we've put all these things forward, much of all of that aligned with our original SOA plan, but also our strategy for improvement plan, which is a larger um, lens, if that makes sense, right? Our SOA, uh, as you'll see next time, it's very fine-tuned and focused, and definitely a part of our larger improvement plans, um, but the SOA plan is meant to be very targeted, right? How are you going to target uh, these particular populations, what evidence-based practices are you going to use? That's the accountability on us that we have to provide for DESE because we're getting this increased funding. Does that make sense, everybody? So we'll be presenting that, I think, in more detail. Not I think. We'll be presenting that in more detail at the March meeting. So, so what we're up against here, the challenges that we're facing, so I'm, I'm being very uh, forthright, I think, with all of you and the community, there are two very large challenges. One I just described in a little more detail, the fact that we did not receive the level of state funding that we anticipated, which is causing us um, pause at this time. And then the second piece of our challenge is that we are negotiating, right? We will be negotiating all of our units. Um, this year, and so uh, that poses a challenge, right, because I don't have the contractual numbers to even carry forward right now because we're in the midst of negotiating with a few and starting to negotiate with the others this spring. And so it poses the challenge, right, of me presenting a balanced budget to the school committee and the city. Um, we're gonna do everything we can to do that, but it's just that I thought this would be really important to share tonight so that the facts of uh, you know what what chapter 70 funds we do have are out there you know the work that um, the mayor and the CAFO and myself and Mr. Goslin we have a lot of work to do together uh, which we plan on doing uh, to see sort of you know where what our projections are uh, for next year uh, and the years to come um, but you know I just I've spoke now for 
I've been speaking now for about 20 minutes straight. So uh, I'm very passionate about this. I, I feel strongly about the direction of our district and I'm gonna do everything I can to try to maintain that direction. Uh, it's just there are going to be significant challenges here to do that. So I will open it up for questions, comments, before we move on. Member Willett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really appreciate the, the comprehensive overview of the budget situation. Uh, definitely is necessary for us to be informed as school committee members. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around the inflation rate because back in 2023, the COLA for Social Security recipients was 8.7%. So that was above the 4.5% that you highlighted in both fiscal year 2023 and fiscal year 2024. Then it uh, was reduced for Social Security recipients to 3.2% for the, the current uh, year. And the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, is currently 3.1%. So I can't derive how they reach the 1.35% unless they're going into the next year for Social Security recipients. But even that with the Kohler adjustment is 1.75%. So even at that stage, they're below that. Now, if anybody's gone to Market Basket, anybody who's purchased oil, for example, um, they're still experiencing double-digit increases in food costs and fuel costs, um, and also healthcare costs. Um, and there's certain items that are not considered part of the, the CPI. So I'm trying to reconcile how if Social Security recipients duly received 8.7% increase because of the reality of inflation back in 2023. And that was the 4.5% was below that. And then the current amount of 4.5% from the state um, still doesn't take into account food costs and fuel costs. And I can understand that. So, but it's still 3.2%. Even if you look at the consumer price index at 3.1%, it's still way below that. So I don't know if Mr. Goslin or anybody can explain how they derived that number because to me it's out of thin air. And that's my opinion. So I don't know how that got I reconciled. We're, yeah, we're, I think that. we're all asking that question. Thank you, Member Willett. I, I, Is we, that something that it's, I know, um, a lot of the regulations and, and chapter laws, they go into a formula, and it's very complicated. Yeah. But we don't have a sense of how that 1.35%, which has no relationship to reality of inflation right now. Right. Um, so I think they're shortchanging, the governor's shortchanging the school system and also the school systems across the state um, I think the 4.5% would have been reasonable to take into account. Um, I'm not really witnessing the soft landing of inflation. It might be reflected in the Social Security benefits going into the next uh, fiscal year, but it's not currently materializing here. And it's even below the CPI. So it's just a big disservice to the residents of Methuen and to the students as a whole. I just wanted to say that for the record. Yeah. And because it's gonna be very tough sailing for us and I don't think it's fair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and we do have, uh, I am fortunate, uh, we, are, we have our legislators uh, who are aware, our area legislators who are aware of the impact that this has had on us. Uh, so I am working directly with them. Um, and we also have some really strong advocacy from our our organization, the MASS, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, they actually did go to a hearing and, and really argue, Member Willett, what you just said, of this doesn't make sense to us, right? How, how are you um, calculating this and how, what would be a fair increase at this point to actually you know, right this wrong, if you would. Uh, so we do have some ag advocacy groups out there. Again, I am, I am 
100% behind it. I will work with everybody I can work with to try to change this. But then our reality also is, you know, we work with the governor's budget that we have. So that's those are the numbers that are concretely in front of us that we're going to our team. So we're, we're trying to, you know, advocate, but also uh, work with our team to make sure we still have to go through the budget process and present a budget to the committee and the city council and have a budget by June 30th. Because even the CPI is a red herring because it doesn't fully take into account certain inflationary measures. Um, but even that was, was 3.1%. Mm. So that's way below even the CPI. So w how are they gauging it? I have no idea. But I, I needed to present my thoughts to the committee on it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Member Bishavilia. So while I agree with Member Willette in the fact that this is nonsense, I think that we have to focus on what we do have control over, and you're right. We need to hope that our delegation can pull a rabbit out of the hat or that some of our ad advocacy groups can make something happen. But in the current time, right now, today, mm -hmm. I'm looking at this, and it tells me that the total school budget next year is projected to be $4 million, $4 million and change, short of 24. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't see how we keep current status and do, is it six unions, seven unions in the school side? Seven. Going into these conversations, $4.2 million short. How, I mean, I understand wanting to keep class sizes the same way, but the, the, the math doesn't jive. Yeah. I agree. And so if I, <laughs> I agree. Um, in response to me, so I think Member Shabilia and Member Willett are both 100% correct, so don't get me wrong. But I, I got I to gotta be honest with you, Superintendent, I'm looking here and I'm scrambling through my numbers because I don't recognize the 119 million. We presented 101 million to City Council last year as the school budget, and that was 52 cents of every tax dollar raised in the city of Mathorne. So do I, um, do I foresee the city um, going up in its contribution? Absolutely. Um, but I've got to be honest here, is it going to be enough to offset um, what's projected here to remember to be like a $4 million loss? I don't see that, right? And I don't be, and so this is where we have to be very careful and sharpen our pencils. So we've got to take a look at, you know, does that 119 represent, you know, employees that were hired on grants um, and various other, you know, uh, revenue sources that were available to us? Uh, not a bad thing. Um, but that we talked about four years ago saying, you know, we're going to have to be careful if we put employees, if we hire employees on grants because we may not be able to afford to keep them, right? And so uh, I don't want to, you know, sound like negative Neil, you know, speaking to the school committee. Do I anticipate that 55 million number from the city going up? Yes, I do. Absolutely do. Um, but I, 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 I just want to, you know, make sure that the committee is on board that we're going to have to look at every every employee of Methuen Public Schools and how they're funded, what pays for them. Um, because, you know, right now, we, we've got to balance, you know, what the taxpayer can afford. And I, I said a minute ago, 52 cents of every dollar in the general fund goes to Methuen Public Schools. Um, and that's not that it shouldn't be that way. I'm just telling you that's, that's the lion's share of what comes out of the general fund. So we try very hard, and we always make sure we stay within the, the foundation budget, as the superintendent would tell you, because we're required to do that by law. Um, so, um, you know, there's going to be some, um, the need to do some really intense dive-ins into all the personnel that we have. Um, uh, and, you know, notwithstanding the CBA, you know, I, I think, you know, We've already, as you know, Superintendent, told the capital, you know, uh, um, stop preparing for these kind of numbers, right? And so that itself is going to be a significant impact to the city contribution. But I, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. The city will not be able to make up the difference between, um, you know, $8 million and $3 million. That's a big chunk. Do I anticipate it going up 2 to $3 million? Probably, yeah. Honestly, and I, I, you know, I'm not giving you numbers. The capital would probably brain me if you heard me say that. But um, 
you know, this is where we've got some difficult work. We still get up to the point that member will let members should really make. We, we've got to work our advocacy and say, you know, this doesn't right. But by the same token, we've got to do the hard work that's required to take a look at all the positions that are funded, how they're funded, and, you know, what opportunities lie in front of us. Um, and I just want to kind of make sure there's a sense of realism because when we presented the 101 million budget to city council last year, those of you that watched know that it was not well received, right? And, uh, you know, that spawned the request for an audit, which I, I've just finished. Member Shabili before he asked me to draft our fee, and I'm ready to send that out for people to take a look at. Um, but, you know, before then, we're going to have to go through, and the schools do a great job, a great job of, you know, putting out a budget workbook that shows you um, by school, by grade, by class, you know, how many people there are, um, how many teachers there are, et cetera, et cetera, how many administrators there are. And so we're going we're gonna to have to take a hard look at that. Yep, thank you. And this, Mr. Geisler. The Mayor, I do want to point out that $119 million does does not include grants, um, but it does include municipal chargebacks, which is usually not discussed when we're doing the operating budget. So it in includes the insurance and yeah. DPW and um, the police. Uh, yeah. So yeah. that's the difference yeah. between the uh, $100, 000, $100 million you were talking about and the 19, 119. Yeah. Member Desaglio. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for pointing that out because I was actually going to ask that question. Because if I recall, going back when we got ESSA money and all that, we tried to avoid staff members to be on ESSA. Mm -hmm. So a lot of. We have few. We have few, mm -hmm. if I'm correct, with grants, with ESSA. Yeah. All right. So that's, 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 that was one of my main concerns, was because I remember pointing that out last time, well, I think it, either one or two years ago. I said, I do not want a lot of on the grants because just in case if the budget right. came back. So I think the last school committee uh, made sure that wasn't much of a problem, with, if I recall. Yes, we have a few. We do have a few. Yeah, a few. Um, and we have some that we know, uh, you know, our, we have some K-8 literacy PAs that we actually had on ESSER 2, but we carried them one more year on ESSER 3, but they know they won't be in those, you know, positions next year. Um, we do have some classroom teachers, staff that we have for class sizes. So we, we know we have a few and we're doing exactly what the mayor just said. You know, we're sharpening our pencils and figuring out retirements and where class sizes can be, um, where we have really small class sizes because uh, enrollment isn't going up everywhere around the district either uh, that we can fill some positions. So we're doing all of that work as we speak. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I do want to, and I don't know if anybody else has questions, I do want to just also say on the last part of this, um, there was a live link on here, so I'm hoping that you guys were able to look at that. If not, I can certainly provide it for you in hard copy. Um, but this is something that, uh, you know, I've had conversations about year after year. I think it's important to say, because we hear it sometimes, and again, on this committee, uh, you know, we, we all have our own understandings of how city and municipal budgets work. Um, but I do think it's important to just mention, you know, the, the city has worked hard to get the free cash um, account, and I'm not gonna speak for the mayor, so I'm not gonna speak long, but I, I did think it was worth putting it in here because uh, that free cash money that the city has, uh, you know, as I stated here at the end of this, this memo, um, that's not typically, uh, that's not something you would use for contractual um, bargaining agreements, collective bargaining agreements. So, you know, th those funds are typically used for capital improvement projects, one-time costs, right? You have an emergency and you, we need to, uh, you know, pay fix for something in the city. Uh, that's typically when those funds are um are used and so it's just it's something that I th thought was important to also say here tonight um, 
you know, because that, that will play into, you know, we don't, when, when Mr. Goslin and I meet with the mayor and Maggie, you know, the conversation of free cash is not part of that conversation. It's really what is the revenue coming into the city that we can afford over time that we look at the collective bargaining agreements. So that's why I added that here, because that is sometimes asked during the process um, or asked by the community. And again, I thought it was important, again, just kind of defining terms and what we have to use. Um, again, challenges for us, challenges for the city moving forward. So I did just want to point that out. Are there so any I don't know questions? if there are other questions. I just have one. Um, I just want to be clear that I heard you say this, but I just want to make it very clear yes. that with the money that we're getting right now in the, in the governor's budget, mm -hmm. We do not have enough money to level fund the district as it is right now today. Is that correct? Yes, but let me add to that statement. Okay. So with the city contribution not increasing significantly and the current Chapter 70 aid, that statement is correct. Thank you. Is that how I would, would I add anything to that statement, Mr. Goslin? I would say it's pretty close. I mean, the big the big issue is going to be our collective bargaining agreements. Yeah. Um, if we didn't have those hanging out there, I'd feel a lot better. Um, but the fact that we know that we're gonna there's going to be a a cost of living increase of some sort, that's the part that's we don't have a the number. tricky part. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I just want yeah. to go back on Superintendent just said. Yeah. So I, and right up front. So I don't see us getting through the CBAs this year without dipping into some level of free cash. Oh. It's just not, you know, I'm, I'm good at budgets, I'm good at math, uh, just ain't gonna happen, right? Um, and part of that is um, what Member Willette and Member Shabilia highlighted when they spoke earlier, right? You, you cannot look at people, um, you know, when inflation is, you tell me, you know, right? we, we, anywhere between 3.1 and, you know, uh, I, I still get mesmerized when I look at the exit market basket. Um, you know, and you can't you can't go back to them and reasonably expect them to accept pay raises of one percent. That's not going to happen. Uh, so what that's going to cause is it's going to cause the city to use some of the free cash, um, you know, to to do any retroactive or back pays or things like that once contracts are negotiated, right? And so that's a definite, um, you know. Um, in my mind, that we're going to have to dip into it a little bit. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll need to work with city council to kind of make sure they understand that. We do not want to always do that. But this is definitely a time when, um, you know, for, you know, after we, after we go through the whole school budget and we're agreed on a budget, and, you know, that's a number that comes from the committee, not just from the mayor and the superintendent. When we're agreed on what that number is going to be, then then the direction for me is to go find out how to fund it, right? And work with the capital and do that. Um, and so I, I think, you know, um, we're not gonna shrink away from that challenge, but you know, the, the, the hard look at the budget book, and, and I'll say it again, that the schools put out, they put out a great budget book, um, uh, is gonna be incumbent upon all of us to make sure we understand, you know, what money's going where and to be used for what, um, and I do, foresee some free cash having to be used, right? Um, we, we built some back. We're still barely at the level that the state says you should be at, right? So the state best practices say you should be at 5% of your general fund. City of Methuen has a general fund of over 200 million. And uh, as, as you can see, 100 plus of that goes to the schools. So um, it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we you know, negotiate fairly, um, that we, you know, make sure that what we carry forward as a budget is realistic and achievable um, and that we all agree to, right? And it, it may involve some painful decisions. Uh, I, I, you know, I can't lie to you. On, on both ends, on the city side, and you know, I'm already, I'm already giving the, the, um, the message out to department heads that there won't be any headcount ads, right? And that's, you know, we had a discussion with council the other night, you know, where they were talking about, you know, we really need to add some firefighters, um, you know, because we could keep four ambulances going full time, 
um, that's how busy they are. And the reality is we've got to kind of balance that between what the what the taxpayer can absorb. We, we did a, you know, our budget last year was, I won't say minimalistic, it was, it did not have a lot of ads in it. And it resulted in uh, a $200 increase per household on average, right? Um, and that was with leaving a million dollars of taxable income on the table. So a million dollars that Prop 2 and a half says we could tax, we did not, because we recognized between inflation and all these other things, you know, how much it was hurting, you know, residents of the city. So I, ju I just, you know, I went on long-winded. I, I want to make sure you understand. I do foresee using some some level of free cash, um, you know, not huge amounts, but we're going to have to use some of it because there's no other place to go to to generate some of the funds that will be needed to support some of these CBAs. Thank you for adding that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Member Willett? Yeah. And again, just to give the context of the situation, is that when the governor was sworn in and started to review the budget, there was a commitment not to do 9C cuts, and I was on record. Then what she did was 9C cuts. Then she was to present her first budget, and it should have been a stabilizing budget. Instead, it's impacting harmfully local communities. And I can't understand if the state has a rainy day account, which is designed to handle stabilization situations. And even the, the House Ways and Means Chair indicated that winter is here in Massachusetts from a fiscal standpoint. Why leadership at the state level is not recognizing that you do not go from 4.5% downward to 1.35% and not realize your impact in classrooms, teachers, and services that we pledge to assist. So that's the dynamic, and that was within, you know, <laughs> went to time she was sworn in to now. It's, it's very, very disturbing trajectory. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Does the committee have any questions about the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services update? I, I had a quick question, Madam Chair. Member Willett? Yeah, in terms of there was one person that was given a waiver, a non-resident to maintain within the system, without going into detail and preserving privacy laws, is that because of McKinney or is that because of something else? So on the residency front. So, so typically <laughs> if we have eighth graders or 12th graders this time of year, uh, we, I make the decision not to exclude them so they can graduate with their peers and it doesn't impact our funding. Okay. That was an agreement that the previous residency subcommittee also agreed to. Oh so you'll see some of those from this point forward just to, to kick a senior out with two months left of school is just a rough. And it's only exclusive to seniors. Eighth grade and seniors are typically those two so they could graduate from the eighth grade and, okay. and their seniors. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have one more question. Sure. Go ahead, Mayor. Ian, this is for Ian. Uh, do we anticipate any more money from DESE? So we've got, I forget what the numbers are, we got some late last fall um, for the transportation, and then I thought we were getting a second tract um, in the spring, and I don't know if we did or not. Yeah, you just, oh. Do we anticipate any more? Yes, we do. We anticipate. Um, some more. We just got an email last week um, saying that there's going to be another round of the $104 per head per student, and uh, we're getting those numbers together to get them to the state so we can get another check. And ballpark, how much will they give us in it? Um, to date, it's about $700,000, a little bit more. Okay. Total. Yeah, total. Okay. Can I just, um, absolutely. Sorry. I just want to make sure that um, I speak about it publicly too. Um, a 
message had gone out district wide, but I also wanted to just bring it up here that at the end of March, we will have our uh, focused monitoring review with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So they'll be on site for a few days um, at the end of March, doing some walkthroughs um, throughout the district, as, um, interviewing some staff as well as parents, but there's also going to be a survey going out to parents um, of students with disabilities to just get some feedback. Um, so for families to be on the lookout for that survey. Great, thank you. Yep. Yes, Member DiZaglio. Uh, wh what's the date of Desi coming again? I'm sorry. Sure, they'll be here March 26th, 27th, and 28th, and that will be a mix between on-site as well as virtual. Thank you. You're welcome. And then if I could just add, because it's it's part of, but in addition to, so I just wanna make sure we don't miss it. Um, Member Shabili, I think, had asked uh, last business, me business meeting, maybe even the first one in January. I'm, it's, I'm kind of getting blurry. Uh, so maybe it's January um, where we did announce our Director of Health Services uh, had resigned uh, due to personal reasons. Um, and there was a request for comps, you know, uh, you know so Ms. Bozak did provide those. Uh, this evening we did not uh, receive a replacement for that. We are consulting out still with Ms. Gallant. She is, doing the things to help us oversee and get through the rest of this year. So we have an agreement with her to do those things. Um, and then we also have a nurse leader, which I think Ms. Bozak put in her memo. Uh, one of our teachers is is uh, has stepped up and agreed to be our nurse leader so that if we have day-to-day -day problems, we have somebody the nurses need to contact. Uh, she is doing that work and getting a stipend for that. One of our school nurses. What did I say? Teacher. Oh, no, not our teacher. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, one of our school nurses has stepped up to be the nurse leader. I apologize. That could be very confusing for those listening. Thank you for the correction. Member Maxwell. Um, what are the student surveys that you said, or the parent surveys, rather, sorry? No, that's okay. Um, so the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will send out surveys. Um, to parents of students with disabilities um, that will just ask some feedback questions um, regarding uh, you know, um, their participation, their satisfaction with um, communication, involvement, that type of thing. How do they know um, the list of... We have to you have to provide a list mm -hmm. of our kids. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So we ran a report from Infinite Campus. We've submitted that information um, to the state. And then the state will also provide opportunities that parents that may not be able to participate in the survey online, they'll also um, offer opportunities for a phone call um, if needed. Okay. And when is that survey supposed to go out? It's supposed to be going out this week. I submitted the list to them last week okay. upon their request, so um, the survey should be going out. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Does the committee have any questions about the Director of Human Resources report? Member Shabilia. So I look through this and it's vacancies, retirements, resignations. It doesn't look like we've hired anybody. <laughs> it's I, no, but it's that that's my takeaway here is our open spots are growing and our hiring seems to be non-existent. That's not incorrect. It's it's we're focused on contracted services more than ever uh, to try to fill. You know, we have six or seven, I think seven at this point, contracted service providers that we're working with to fill some of our vacancies. Um, but you are correct. You know, we also have, you know, unexpected leave of absences that are happening uh, and they're just that unexpected. Uh, we're having trouble even when we post for long-term substitutes, even getting folks who are willing to do long-term classroom program assistant positions at this point. It's, it's a, a huge struggle all the way around. So building on that, given our relatively bleak budget allotment, 
should we maybe stop hiring until we get things finalized, unions settled? I, I worry that anybody we hire by luck or happenstance between now and June 30th yeah. may not make the cut come July 1 because of circumstances well beyond all of our control. Yeah, great point. And so uh, a couple things are in provision already, provisioned for already. So with the program assistance, we're not allowed to hire permanent by contract. So any program assistance that we do hire would be long-term subs. So they would not automatically carry forward to next year. So that's something that has happened after a certain date in the fall, it, we stop being able to hire uh, permanently. Uh, so that's one of the pieces. So any, we do have some long-term subs in our program assistant positions, but again, those aren't automatically carried forward. Those folks in those positions aren't automatically carried forward. Um, our staffing right now, I, I, uh, we don't have many permanent openings that we are looking to hire permanently. We are trying to fill those with long-term subs right now, and uh, we've, we've exhausted our postings for permanency probably around Christmas time. So, so we, ha we have, you know, some of those positions, we just, there's a few maybe that are in the works that we're hiring for permanently that we know we wouldn't be able to eliminate uh, in the future. And anything that we post, we do have some positions that I would not ever recommend eliminating from the budget. Anything that we post this spring would be anticipated, you know, contingent upon the budget. So there are some postings that I would, you know, some retirements that I just, I don't know how we would, those wouldn't be positions that would be something that our principals would eliminate. Um, again, they, they would be posted as anticipated for that reason to protect ourselves in, in case. All right, thank you. So yeah, it's not positive. Any other questions? All right, does the committee have any questions about the facilities report? So I'm just gonna make one comment that the, the uh, and it, you tell me if you want me to eliminate it. We didn't change much about the last two pieces, the IVAC, so you could see the projects. We don't have much movement on those two and the district-wide repairs. The main part that was updated or changed is where it says the general monthly that's what we're focused on each month, updating or changing or adding to. Um, just so you, you're not looking for any kind of new information at this point in those last two pages, if that makes sense to everybody. We'll know a little bit more about the IVAC. Uh, we have uh, six projects right now out to bid, uh, these on this sheet here with IVAC, so we'll know at the end of the month what we will be able to afford, uh, if anything, with our IVAC grant money, uh, any potential S or three money that has to be spent by September 30th, and then what we would have to put on the capital improvement plan, which we have a, a deadline of actually this Friday to submit to Maggie, the sort of what the projects could be and how much the estimated cost would be. If that Mr. makes sense. So this past Friday, Member Maxwell and I were invited to go to the civics class at the Marsh, the eighth graders, Yeah, which was awesome. I'm a little disappointed none of them were here, though they said they were going to be, but I get it. Yeah. Um, in that discussion, they shared that the upper school gym, the big gym at the Marsh, is mm -hmm. perpetually leaking. And I didn't see that on the roof project repairs. So I just want to make sure that is out there. Um, the students were saying that? Yeah, all of them collectively. <laughs> we're well aware of the lower school gym issues because of the placement, because it's underneath the roof that has not been repaired. And that's what I noticed that this one on the district wide roof project repairs. Yeah, is the lower the second school. Second grade wing, which I would say. Yeah. So I would just. Call I'd have to ask. That is not something that we have, yeah, that we, has been brought to our attention, the upper school gym. Um, yeah, they, they really liked to talk and tell us things, yeah. the ones that were chatty and the other ones just wanted to pretend we weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a couple of items throughout these pages. Um, one, for example, here in the high school, you've got pricing for new water heaters and a few others. Mm -hmm. Are we, are we, that stuff is all budgeted through grant right now, correct? No. 
Which 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 items are you so looking the at? The HVAC. I thought there was some uh, a, a grant going right now for HVAC improvement that we discussed. So some so so on the HVAC projects, you'll see next to it if we if we've already encumbered the funds or paid for the project with ESSER three. I did indicate that on this sheet. Are you looking at that sheet, Member yep. Shabili, that says current HVAC projects? Yes. Yes. So anything that that we're we're looking at uh, ESSER three that says funded, that means it's already been done and encumbered. There's some here that say IVAC, and we I say funded, that was probably premature because we haven't gotten the bids back, but we're eye eyeing uh, the IVAC grant for some of these projects. And again, unfortunately, the estimates are coming back in astronomically. So I'm not, I, I, what we thought, the IVAC could probably s support two of these projects. It looks like that's not gonna happen, so that's why we have to be very, uh, detailed when we submit our capital improvement projects to the city to, to prioritize these projects because these these have to get done uh, you know it's just it's what funding sources do we have that we can get them done now and what do we have to put on the capital improvement plan for FY25 and then likely some of these are going to have to move to FY20 this is a lot of money I mean this is millions of dollars on these two pages here um, so uh, yeah, so that's our hope here that we're going to be busy in the next two weeks trying to organize these open bids, make sure that we have our grant funding spent to zero is our goal. So just know that uh, we will spend our ESSER funds and our IVAC grants down to zero on the appropriate projects and then what we have to ask the city for on the capital improvement plan. Thank you. You're welcome. Member Tazoglio. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I did not see what the handicap parking um, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, to say, sorry. Um, um, part of the project, how is that going right now? Because I don't see it on. Yeah, so great question. And I probably should have put it on here somewhere. Um, so we have uh, all of the bids right now are out to bid for the main entrance parking structure to be ADA compliant. Uh, the bus loop ice rink entrance to be changed with ADA compliant parking at the new entrance and the field house and the field, and then the tennis court project. So all three of those bids were done by the same engineering firm, and all three of those projects are earmarked to be uh, completed by different fund sources. Right, so ARPA is the tennis court project right now under Steve Angelo. ESSER 3 is our ice rink entrance and parking lot, loop parking lot uh, project. And then the main entrance is CIP, so capital improvement for the city. So we're just, we're basically, what March is all about waiting. We're waiting because until those bids come back and we see uh, how much those, you know, it's just, we just, we already talked about increased costs. Uh, some of the estimates that we've gotten, not for the parking projects, but the HVAC, I think threw us a little bit off of what the initial estimates were six months ago even. So we'll see how the bids come back for all of those, but those are all out and ready to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Does the committee have any questions about the out of school suspensions and other disciplinary actions report? Member Shavilia? Um, the only request I have is going forward, if we could break them out, something Luann and I were talking about before she left was breaking out the drug-related suspensions versus things for you know violence or fighting, um, stuff that may be gang-related or whatever the the causes are. I think that would help to better focus when budget time comes and we're focusing on what programs need the most investment. Any other questions? All right, may I have a motion and a second to approve the policy BEDA, notification of school committee meetings, final read. So moved. Second. Moved by Member Willett, second by Member Desoglio. Discussion. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, through the chair to the superintendent, once this policy is hopefully approved and finalized tonight, can we get an assurance in, internally about the accessibility 
provision in the policy because I'm very concerned about that. I don't want that to come back to us that we do not provide accessibility and the documentation for the disability community. Yep. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, we need a roll call. Ryan Desaglio. Yes. <laughs> Got really loud. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Ouellette? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. All right, Superintendent, would you please start the discussion on the cell phone protocol? Yes, so the next two items, uh, the cell phone discussion and the mar parking discussions, those also were topics that came up, I think, in January. And we said because we have, these are, hand, these are not standalone policies. They don't exist as policies. They exist as protocols in the handbook, which you will all vote on as an entire policy. If that makes any sense. That's how it was always described to me by MASC. Um, but there are thing, there are actual standalone policies in the handbook that you would have to vote on and that we've had to revise as standalone policies. Um, but a lot of what the handbook is, uh, much like what you guys did with the program of studies, if that makes sense, right? It's, it's still, a, there's a lot of information there, protocols, how we do our business, uh, but they're not standalone policies that the school committee would vote on. So these two act similarly to that. Um, both of these are in the handbook and they're in the handbook as I attached in the memo uh, on the bottom of that. And there was also uh, a request, I believe, by Member Willette to have um, for the parking protocol, the current balance and then, you know, recent expenses, you know, what we have used those funds for. So we added that to that memo as well. Um, so I think we're just looking for uh, a discussion tonight, uh, you, you know, about this. if. And I can share with you the conversation I had with the building principals, and that was a conversation I had with um, Member Willette uh, about this, uh, and then any other conversation that you guys want to have for this. This, you know, we wouldn't be looking at changing anything. Uh, I would, I would not advocate for changing anything right now. The handbook is in place. We're we're moving forward. This would be changes that that we would. Any changes that would come to these would be for the 24-25 school year. Um, so, so initially our conversation uh, between Member Willette and I, and I think we actually started the conversation here in January, but again, that seemed like a really long time ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, was, you know, do we, do we, do we want to look at other protocols for misuse of cell phones, using cell phones, pouches? There's a lot of conversation right now in the public about uh, cell phone use in schools, right? You see high schools are trying things, taking things back, trying it, taking it back. Um, so there's just a lot of conversation out there. I might have shared with all of you that Desi put out a grant uh, and piloted with school districts who wanted to apply for it, the pouches. Um, you know, so we weren't sure where this was headed at a state level uh, or not. I don't, I don't, I still don't know the answer where that's headed. Uh, the current commissioner is leaving, so I don't know how much he had to do with this movement of the cell phones, but um, I did, I did bring the idea of pouches up with the principals uh, and I actually uh, requested a few samples of the pouches so I could see what they look like. Um, there are some that are $40, which I don't think we could fiscally manage. Um, and there are some that are $10. And so I have a couple of those in my office. Um, and uh, the $10 are just that, they're $10. They would break in two seconds and they're clear and kids would be looking at them with their phones having alerts through the clear plastic. So not something I think would be worth our while. But the principals and I had a conversation about it, and right now, uh, you know, they are thinking that the pouches would probably be just as much, if not more, work for them to police the pouches. It would be one more thing that our staff would have to try to figure out. Pouches, magnetics, who who is accountable for that and who isn't. Um, some of the systems that are in place now, which which would lead to maybe some more conversations about more widespread use of that 
is some of our classroom teachers have been very successful. It is not something that we dictate that they do. They don't have to do it. Um, but some of our teachers use bins or pouches that in the beginning of class, kids put their cell phones in a bin or a pouch so that it's not disrupting classroom instruction in that classroom. When they leave, they take it back out. Um, so it, it deters what we wanted to deter, which is classroom disruption. However, uh, kids will still have their phones in the hallways and at lunchtime. Um, which we are you know, trying to deter misuse of that at this point. Also recognizing we don't want kids not to have their cell phones in case of emergencies. It's a lifeline, we totally get it. Um, you know, Some of that comes with the honor system, right? If you have a bin or a pouch, kids actually have to tell us they have their phone and willingly put that in. We're not gonna go searching for that cell phone, right, uh, where it is. Um, so that was one thing. And then uh, they also have systems. I think what was really part of our longer conversation was that they have um, some fairly reliable systems of students who are misusing phones as part of the infraction that they're getting in trouble for. Um, they do have systems in place to check in, turn in phones, child can get the phone at the end of the day, child can check in at lunchtime. Um, so they already have like a pouch system, if you would. They just were not using a pouch and trying to keep track of that um, for any of the, and I mean like, you know, um, repeat serious offenders of that. They, they all really kind of openly shared what their system would be for that. Um, so they're not looking to change this at this point. Uh, it's cell phones are hard enough. Uh, and we're never gonna get them out of the schools, and I don't think that's what we also, we may not want them out of schools. Um, it's a challenge, and we're just, we're trying to figure out how to best meet that challenge so kids are not using them inappropriately in school, violating privacy of other students. Um, you know, there's just, there's a lot of that, and, and the misuse we're trying to handle through the student handbook, you know, how it's organized. So I don't know if that makes sense. It was, it was a general conversation. Again, something that member Willette and I had a conversation about probably a month or so ago uh, in more detail. And so I was able to share that with the principals to see what they thought, like how was this going? You know, we had a lot of conversation about this particular part of the handbook uh, in the fall. And so I just think it's important that we have the conversation, revisit, keep it, change it. You know, I think they're the ones living it every day as well. So their input was important. Member DeSaglio. Um, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So one of the things I was thinking about this, I, I know we're talking to the principals and seeing the policy, but I would love to know what the teachers' inputs are. Um, and they, if they want, they, maybe we could get a survey out um, to them to kind of see where they feel like that cell phone policy is. Is it working? Is it? Do they see? Um, do they see that it's still a distraction in their classroom? Um, and that's one of the things I, I, I really think we should look look at as an educator um, in a middle school where we have no cell cell phone use. They are to put it in the bag, and and if not, we confiscate it. Um, it's worked very well in that but obviously it's a middle school it's totally different compared to a high school um but one of the things that i i did appreciate my administration saying is how is it that without the cell phone use um if it works and obviously we voted yes it's perfect to it. um so i would love to see the feedback from the lower school middle school and high school and see where the areas that we need to work on I know we try to change the policy differently, and that was a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love to see the areas of focus that maybe we can, I don't know, not change the policy, but see okay. where they need. Yep, fair enough. We have time to do that, so that's helpful. Member Maxwell? Um, I would just like to comment on it. I think that the cell phone policy we have now is great. I think that, you know, taking something else away for the kids that don't abuse their phones and don't abuse their privileges. I think, you know, in, instead of assuming everybody's gonna do bad, we assume they do good, and the kids that are repeat offenders, then, you know, you take them away or you put them in bags or whatever. But I, I would not be in support of bags or kids 
having their phones taken away unless they're repeat offenders or they're not doing right by their their phones. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, thank you. If I could build, Madam Vice Chair, off what uh, Member Maxwell just said. Yes. So um, you'll know with the last school committee, I kind of stood alone on this. Um, and, um, you know, I can't help, I know that cell phones can be a, a pain in the butt, but while students are in school, you know, we're educators. We have an, a responsibility to educate them. And to me, that includes social responsibility. And that includes, you know, appropriate and, and sometimes inappropriate uses of cell phones, right? And so to what Member Maxwell said, which I support 1,000%, <clears throat> For the people that violate the policy, you know, we should be dealing with that, right? For the people that aren't, um, you know, you're. I think we're sending a, a bad message by firing our shot across the bow. And so I just, you know, I, I think when we start to discuss this again, um, I, I think we need to consider all aspects and whatever the will of the school committee is what I'll go with as I did last time. Uh, but. I just wanted to, you know, you know, put my two cents in and say that I think, you know, we've got an obligation to kind of make sure that our, our youth understand before they become adults, you know, that there's, you know, because it isn't just children that are misusing cell phones, right? So you got, you got, um, you know, fights, you know, between adults that are being filmed by other adults that could be breaking up the fight. And, and I guess that's a long, you know, discussion whether you want them to get involved or not. But, you know, I guess, you know, teaching them just to put it on cell phone or video is, is not the message we want to send. So I think we, we, you know, just need to be careful here how far we go down the path. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Member Vallette. Uh, thank you. And we had long discussions, the superintendent and myself, and my mission was not to reinvent the wheel was not to encroach upon the instruction of, with the teachers or the managerial approach of the principals or the day-to-day -day education of the students. And we have to separate the academics in that <coughs> mission and the social landscape of kids will be using cell phones. And I concur with the mayor that if it's for nefarious purposes we will clamp down on it and if it's illegal the police will be involved mm -hmm. in the situation um, I like personally the idea of giving the discretion to the teachers to use the bin I'm not sure if that needs to be an addendum to the policy just to reflect that and codify it that the teachers do have the authority um, during testing times and examinations or even classroom instructions at their discretion to revert to a bin. Mm -hmm. And I think that will solve the situation because we need to be focused on academics, the repeat serious offenders. We need to clamp down on that. Um, and we have a policy already in place and if it becomes nefarious and illegal, then the police will investigate uh, those matters. Um, I was looking at the Lowell Public Schools and I thought it was the wrong approach. I thought the pouches might be a solution, but they're flimsy and you know either expensive or shoddy and it's not gonna be effective. And if it's see-through, what exactly is the purpose of that? And plus, um, the state funding is already being exhausted even if we did a pilot program. So the only thing, I think a lot of thought already went into the cell phone policy, I can see it. The only thing I would recommend is that based on the discretion of each teacher, and that might solve what Member DiZoglio is saying, leave the discretion of the teacher to use the bin based on his or her interpretation of what's happening in the classroom. Um, so it's, to me that would be a laissez-faire approach to it and not reinventing the wheel. Thank you. Maybe that's how I can word the survey, too, to see if that's an option that they want yeah. to have at each of their discretion. Member Maxwell. Do we have a cell phone policy for staff or just students? So no, there's a cell phone use expectation. Right? With Remember, staff. these aren't policies, right? They're, right, they're, protocol. There are protocols and practices, but yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Are there any other questions? Um, I just have one other comment. Um, 
I know one of the problems with cell phones is that things get, uh, fights get recorded and other things get recorded. And I think we need to be really careful about our policy in limiting it to just cell phones and now smartwatches. Um, and I only mention this because for Christmas, my daughter received from her dad um, glasses that now can record anything you're looking at. Um, and it's amazing and it, it works with your phone and it's phenomenal, but if you have somebody with these prescription glasses on, you can't tell them they can't wear their prescription. But we do need, I think we need a recording policy that's very clear about what's allowed and what's not with mm. digital devices. So I'm just throwing that out there. I stay one step I think, ahead. I think, I think, Madam um, Chair, I think it already says, it, it says cell phone or other electronic device that disrupts. So if it's, if it already says, uh, you might have to add the, but if it says cell phone or other electronic device use, so maybe just add or other electronic device oh, yeah, the use. Last bullet. So maybe add that to the what the first sentence would be, uh, and that it's might allay the chairwoman's concerns about because you have mm -hmm. technological advances, and then we have to leapfrog and catch up to those advances. Yep. So if we take or other electronic device and put that also or where it needs to be placed, mm -hmm. that might be helpful. <coughs> that might solve that issue. And I, I agree with you. Thank it's you. like kind of James Bond stuff, so. It is, thank you. I Remember have one more Zaglio? Did you have another I, I, No, not at this time. I, I, I'm, gonna, okay. I'm gonna push back on that. I do, I have a little um, question. So with the cell phones and smart watches and any other smart device, we, we provide iPads that have the exact same capability as cell phones. You can make calls, you can take videos, you can take cameras, so are we taking iPads away? And if we're taking iPads away, then how are they getting their education? So no, and most of those have been turned off for the kids. Kids can't text on their, their iPads. We don't, we don't have those turned on for the kids to be able to use the, that. They, they can can't. email. They can email, and we have that throughout the district. All of our grammar school kids can email as well. And we can take pictures and video, even on the Chromebooks, we can do that. We do the same thing. So it's the same, it's once we get alerted, we have systems in place on the iPad and Chromebook. So, so often the director of technology and tech staff will get an alert that something inappropriate has come across this device. And so that alerts the principals in the building to go then look at the device. Same thing, and we'll handle it the same way through the, it's inappropriate use of school property, right? It's a little different than the cell phone, but it's still inappropriate use of school property. We'll go through the handbook and consequences that way. Yeah. That just, um, so no. that just also reminded, thank you, uh, thank you Madam Vice Chair. Uh, to, I don't know what the program is called, but a teacher can see. Yes. Yeah, what's it called? Guardian. Guardian, go Guardian. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that. On mean, the Chromebook, not the iPad, but yeah, go yeah. Guardian on the Chromebooks. All right, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, go <laughs> And the, the other part of that, uh, Member Maxwell, is that the Chromebooks and iPads are on our network and the cell phones are not, right? So the cell phones are just on cellular, uh, you know, uh, networking. They're not on our Wi-Fi, so we can't control what the kids see on the cell phones and what they do with. So we'll never, we'll never get alerted if those things are happening on a s privately, you know, owned cell phone. So. All right. Uh, so Superintendent, will, will you will you please start the discussion on the MHS parking protocols and fees? So same idea, the, the, the language on the bottom that starts with student parking is what's currently in the high school handbook, right? So this obviously only pertains to our high school kids. It's not in the KE grant uh, handbook. Um, and there was some conversation about, um, you know, potentially altering this, looking at a different fee schedule. Um, so that is just open for conversation. Again, mm -hmm. we have time, so that the time is actually on our side with these because you know we don't have to. It's the only thing that's on our side uh, with these right now is is time, just because we don't typically have those final handbooks until the summer. But yeah. I'll open the conversation. I think this was asked. You know, Member Willett, I think asked for this, but there was some other conversation about this by other members in January. 
For the current balance in that revolving account, are there any restrictions on what that revolving account can be used for? Yes, it has to be spent on the parking lot. Period. It could be used for plowing, could be used for any upkeep, maintenance, or fixing anything of the parking lot. Security? If it's for the parking lot, yes. Do we have any projections for what we intend to use that 56 grand? I had envisioned more? using a whole uh, chunk of it that's I was kind of letting it build a little bit to take down the trees in the island and asphalt that. But now that's going to be part of the uh, so three project, I believe. Um, so I was hoping to use that for any overages in that area. But other than that, there's nothing locked down right now. But that that's what I had in mind. Because inevitably something will, they'll find stumps somewhere that they need to, we need to pay an extra 30 grand to get rid of. Hey, you'd be amazed when they start digging, the stuff they find, and then we, we're already there. So we have to take care of it. So that's what I had in mind, but I'm open to uh, suggestions. Member Willett. Thank you. Originally, I was in favor of eliminating the fee. And I think in consultation on an individual basis with some members, I think they believe the fee is excessive, but I think there also is a sentiment to maintain the fee at some level. And I prefer to have it more in concert with the neighboring community of North Andover, which is a wealthier community than us, and also Haverhill. So for instance, North Andover is $40, not $100. And Haverhill is, is $10, not $100. And is it, when someone does the parking application, does that cover the entire years? If so if let's say a junior gets their license in the summer, they need the park, and they have junior year, senior year, is that on an annual basis, that application? Okay, so over the course of uh, two years, we're going to charge someone $200 just to park at Methuen High School. To me, that's not acceptable. I don't know about the sentiments of the committee. I would rather have that money spent on an AP examination or to save for college or to save for books or to do something else. We already have parents and other people paying taxes in this community. And again, it's not in line with North Andover at $40 or Haverhill at $10. I would be interested, I'm going to toss it out to the committee for discussion, is having it at $20. So we, we cover the administrative fees. We're still building up the account. I think it's more reasonable, right? And again, if it's the major excavation and reworking as part of the capital budget anyways. So if there's something we want to do in terms of security, which I advocated for without going into detail, or something happens maybe with a little bit of drainage or removal of trees, within reason, we will be able to take the money out of the account and handle that situation and still build up the account over time. But to have the mindset back when the policy was approved that this is a budget crisis and we're going to put it on the backs of kids we don't have user fees in Methuen. We don't have it for athletics. We don't have it for the bus. We only have it for parking, and I think it's outserved its usefulness. So that would be my suggestion to the committee. I represent one voice, one vote, is to have it effective for 2024-2025 school year, is to have it as $20, and then down the line of a future a committee wants to revisit it, that's all the power to that committee. But to have it $56,000, and we already did an expenditure of $11,000. I think that's an ample account, and I don't want to piggyback on the backs of kids. I read AP examination fee or saving for college or saving for books or going into the workforce. And that's just my opinion. Thank you. Member Maxwell. The fee, the fee is $100 if they get their license in September. That's the beginning of the year. And then there's a sliding scale for the rest of it, correct? So like if they got their license in June, they'd only pay $10. So I, I just, I just want to make it known that I, I fully support the $100 fee. I think that all of the 
all of the money that we can, the 56,000, if it's going towards the parking lot, great, we'll have well-kept parking lots for the high school. It doesn't go to any other school, it just goes to the high school, correct? Um, so, I mean, I would be, I'm supporting the $100 fee with the sliding scale for the rest of it. I just wanted to make that known. Member Shabilia. Over the last few years, have you had any students come forward to seek assistance with the $100 fee that have more than just baseline complained about paying the fee? Has there been any issues with kids not able to afford the fee? Yeah, that would be a question for a the question high school. A question I'd have to ask Barden. Mr. Barden. Yeah, we'd have to ask Mr. Barden. Not that I'm aware of, but that I'm removed from the high school, you know. If we wanted to change the fee, when do we need to make that determination to be, go into effect for the next year? Anytime between now and June. Okay. So that we can put it in the final um, handbook uh, and it can go out and the high school staff would know to start sending that out in August to families. So we have some, that's why I'm saying time is on our side with these two. It's nice to have, have time. We have time. I know, we have time on our side. Um, so I mean, I, I fall in the middle on this one. A hundred dollars is a lot. I mean, I fairly certain I paid fifty dollars to park when I was in high school, and that was almost twenty years ago now. So I mean, inflation. If we're going to talk about it everywhere else. We have to talk about it in parking too. But I also agree, we shouldn't be riding on the backs of kids. But I also look at it as a. It's kind of like a little reality check. Anywhere I'm going to go as an adult, if we go into Boston on Friday night. I'm paying for parking. If I go downtown Lowell, I'm in some places I'm paying for parking or if I'm in somewhere I'm putting money in a meter. It's it's kind of that little nudge into adulthood. So I I can I would entertain a reduction, but I, I don't think I could go as low I know I can't go as low as twenty bucks. So I think we have we have time on our side. <laughs> Member Zoglio. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So, I'm agreeing with um, both members. Um, I don't believe a hundred dollars should be that. It shouldn't be that that high, especially with taxpayers um, paying a lot and an extra hundred dollars so they could, could drive to school. However, I do not believe that it should be low as twenty dollars especially when we are thinking about certain things that we want outside and I don't want to talk about. Um, and Mr. Mayor I don't, uh, knows that as well. Um, and so we, uh, the question is, can we use this type of funds for certain things that we want to do outside in the parking lot? Um, we're still waiting for that, right, Mr. Mayor, on that? I'm sorry, yeah. I, I don't know if I could say it. So, and can you guys hear me? Yeah. Am I coming through? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I, you know, it depends on what you want to do, right? So, um, I will say that I, I like the approach the schools have with it now. Um, I also resonate with Member Shabili's point, uh, except I won't say it was 20 years ago. It was almost 40 years ago I graduated high school, and I paid $100 to bring a car to Central Catholic. And so the hundred dollars was the privilege of being allowed to bring a car onto the property, right? Um, I think you know we've got fifty-six grand in the account. Um, I and I would defer to Ian on this. There's no doubt in my mind that we're going to dip into that with some of this, if if for nothing at all. <clears throat> Once the complete parking lot is paid, you know we're going to have to paint it all, right? Because it's going to have all all new spaces in different areas, right? And to his point of, you know, shrinking or minimizing the islands um, and the trees, to me that, that you know, that passes the, the, you know, the audit sector of, you know, we're doing it to kind of keep the park of us. I'm actually, and I hate to say, I'm kind of with Member Maxwell on this one. Um, and I think, you know, to me, it's all about the privilege of being able to bring a vehicle onto school property. Right, not just the, the, the parking fee, but if, if the school committee decides, 
in all good conscience to do something better because I, I do like what member let's say right I you know I'd, I'd love to be able to fund some students taking AP exams uh, but you know I don't see this right now as exorbitant I, I do believe um, you know that we we've got some time to take a look at it and thoroughly debate it and, and make a decision um, but I, I also like the sliding scale and um, the fact that you know a student who who gets his or her license because remember most of the time you're talking juniors and seniors here right and the juniors um unless they're way more advanced than the mayor was you know are getting their license towards the latter half of their their junior year right that's when they become you know able to drive the vehicle and uh, you know have a license and, and drive it um and then they, they have you know their whole senior year so i don't know you know ian i'd, I'd ask you if we have we received many complaints from parents about the, the parking fee? Uh, I have not personally, but I would have to check with the high school to see um, yeah. what kind of complaints they've received. Well, let's just check on that before we have the full discussion, right? So, because if people think it's exorbitant, then we have to take that into account, right? But um, I, I, I kind of stand on this with Member Maxwell right now, right? But um, open to open discussion unlike our national leaders, so. Um, yeah, I would like to say something. Um, I, oh, sorry. No. I personally. Um, I personally don't drive a car, but I do have a lot of friends that um, own um, a license and they do park at the building and they have um, complained about the, um, um, the parking fee. And they feel as though it's a little too high. Like, I understand that the um, money goes into the parking lot, and I think that's very smart. But I do think that the fee should at least be lowered somewhat because there are students who are lower income, and $100 is just a bit too much, in my opinion. Thank you. And, and just to give context, before 2018, the parking fee was zero. Not 10 years ago, not 20 years ago, right, that they had a parking fee in Methuen. It was zero before 2018. And the premise was we have to deal with the budget crisis. And the budget crisis disappeared, but that account still remained. So I have a different philosophy than other people, is that when you add a fee or you add a service or you add a charge, it accumulates over time and then you lose the usefulness of that original purpose. Now, Member Shabelia brought up about lowering it, and if there's a motion at some point or a sense of the committee to have it at $40, I'm gonna run with that because it's not $100. But any reduction of the parking fee is better than $100 that did not exist prior to 2018, and it was based on a false premise. We don't have it for buses, we don't have it for athletics, and maybe Forest Lake we have a, 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 a summer permit, but for other services in Methuen, do we charge people a fee? You know, like we do for this, if someone parks at the Searles building, do we charge, do we have a meter there? So like the, the comparison to Boston and Night on a Town, these kids are obligated to have to go to Methuen High School and receive an education, right? And it's a disconnect that I'm receiving right now. And ultimately it's the, the committee, but please don't say we can't reduce it to maybe 40. North Andover is a much wealthier community than Methuen, but they have it at 40. But we have to do $100 in Methuen I'm all set with that, thank you. I'm just all glam. Um, I think, I'll, and, and I agree with you. And, but however though, they do have the option to take a bus. I know when I was 18, 19 years old, even though I didn't need to pay a parking fee, um, I rode the bus uh, to school. Um, and that was because reducing in gas and and so depending on the situation, though, they still have that option. But I agree with you. I think $100 on a student that's getting ready for college 
shouldn't be paying so they can, because you don't know they're going to work. Even though I worked after school too and I walked to Market Basket from here. Um, but that's the thing we need to look at as well. Um, I don't think that we can go as low as 20. I, I, I agree. Um, but I, I do believe that we should reduce it somewhat. Um, but yeah. Member Maxwell. My only concern with raising it to $40 would be, or I mean, lowering it to $40 or whatever the lowered fee would be, would that be, I mean, if, if somebody got their license in June, would they pay the $40 and the somebody that got their license in September also pay the $40? So, you know, it's not, it's, it's I just want to be like relative to, and then as far as like it being a privilege to park, yes, it is a privilege. Um, because we do offer busing. So they can still get their education without driving their car to school. Freshmen and sophomores at college don't even have that option. So, Matt. So. Does it, I have one thing to say yeah. before Member Ouellette. Um, if we took all the kids that were driving to school and we put them on buses, mm -hmm. how many more buses would we have to pay for? Because to me, we're charging them for the quote privilege of parking, but yet we're actually reducing our responsibility and the number of buses that we have. And I would think that it would be at least one or two buses that we would have to add if all of those kids were to ride the bus. So I feel like we're, we're getting a free ride for a couple buses, which is way more expensive than the $100 that we're charging, number one. And number two, we're then on top of that charging them to come to school. So I, I do feel that the $100 is excessive. Um, eliminating altogether, I, I would actually be in favor of because I feel like we, while we do provide busing, they're doing us a favor by not taking the bus. By, and we're reducing our budget by that much. So that's my opinion. If I could just add one thing, uh, I'm sorry, Member Lett. Yeah. So I can add actually two things. Uh, I was gonna recommend that if it makes sense for us to have Mr. Barden speak on this behalf at the next business meeting, right? He comes to all the business meetings with the SOAR awards and such, we can have him comment on some of the questions that you've asked that I don't, you know, unfortunately, Mr. Goslin, I don't know the answers to that question. Um, but I, I believe the question about the busing is an interesting one because I do not believe our number of bus routes at Methuen High School has changed uh, because of this. So we had 23 routes, 23 routes before the parking fee was, was um, implemented and we have 23 routes today. So I think it's just a matter of total number of kids on those routes around the community. Uh, you know, there's just less kids on the buses is what I think is happening. Um, but I mean, that's, that's to your question, we've never had to change the bus routes because of the number of kids driving. We've always had kids drive and the fee or no fee hasn't changed the number of kids driving, I guess is how I would look at it, right? I also wanna make sure, I know we presented this before, but this, the parking fee came 100% from the school committee requesting of this, right? This is not something that the administration there presented and never. said we should do. It was a much longer conversation uh, about the why and us going through this. And I think to member Maxwell's question, one of the thing or comment, uh, one of the hardest parts when they presented it to us to say, come up with a proposal, what does it look like? Um, one, of the, one of the conversations I know Mr. Barden and I, lengthy and multiple, was the sliding part of it. Like, well, if a kid gets it in, do you do half? Half a year is this, regardless of which month you get it in, and half a year is this. You know, how do you do that so that it looks fair uh, and not, you know, astronomical and there's a system in place? Um, so that was part of our original, you know, uh, idea behind this, that it's a $10 increment per the month so that I get it in March, I'm paying a little bit, but I'm not paying $100 of which somebody would pay if they had it the whole year. It's just a little background on that one, but, and again, this is this is 100% at the will of the committee. I will certainly bring uh, Mr. Barden and, you know, help, hopefully he'll be able to answer some of your questions and what his thoughts are. Has it helped, has it hurt? I, you know, I'm not sure how, how the, what the approach would be on that. Remember what? Yeah, uh, thank you. Madam Chair, I want to thank the student representative 
for voicing her comments. It does help because they are the stakeholders. Um, and I want to have that outreach as well. Um, also, there was no indication, even if we reduce it, whether it's $40 or $20, um, we probably would have to do some type of uh, sliding scale fee just for equity purposes. And then the $100, it, it doesn't have any consideration already in the application for someone who has uh, low income status. So it's straight out $100 regardless. If you do it a normal school year, it's $100 for that person regardless of the household income. So that should have been considered at that moment in time. So we're talking about equity and income disparity and all those other factors. That wasn't accomplished at that time either. So I'm hoping that the stakeholders will be uh, voice their opinions. I'm hoping there's a reduction. I hope that maybe is a compromise. And we start to resolve some of these issues because if you're gonna still have $100, what's the sense? There's been nobody telling me what the purpose of this account is other than, well, maybe we might use it down the line for something or we might divert it for something else. And that's not how government operates. You have a line item and you should be using it for that line item only. And if the fee is not serving its usefulness anymore, you do away with the fee. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, moving on. To, does the committee have any questions on the expenditure report? I will let you know that all the payrolls are posted up till the end of February. I noticed that when I was looking at it, the math, the math started to balance out. <laughs> so. Anything? Actually, I do have one question. Member Spilia. Um, on the AR report, is there- Which report? Um, the revolving, the one with the ice rink on it. Revolving, okay, yep. To me, it's an AI report because it has revenue received to date. Okay. Um, for things like the ice rink and the facilities rentals, are those paid up front or do we have outstanding receivables? Um, there would be some outstanding receivables, not a ton. Um, our biggest renters, uh, well, first of all, the facility rental, that was due to deposit up front and a security deposit as well that they get back if they don't destroy anything. Um, and then once they're done, we do invoice them and they pay us. Um, ice rental, we have two really large groups that uh, Methuen Youth Hockey as well as the Valley League, and they do pay after they rent because sometimes we end up canceling, et cetera. They don't pay ahead of time. Say the ink goes down, uh, but they are, they are up to date. So we have no aging receivables? Excuse me? Aging receivables, no. nothing that's 60, nope. 90 days No, nope. we, we did, um, I think I mentioned it at one of the last meetings, we were struggling with one of them who wasn't willing to pay the rate, well, they came around. So they're up to date. Are there any other questions on the revolving funds? Um, any questions on the grant report? I have one. Mr. Mayor. Um, Ian, the homeless emergency line, is that the money that Desi's paying us? Yes. Okay. So, but it shows a remaining belt. So, does that not get um, used for the transportation costs? Uh, it will be, yes. We have, um, actually, we have a couple um, contracts in here for homeless that we'll be using that for. And I just noticed that it looks like a typo there. I will get back to you on that because it looks like, um, oh no, never mind. We must have got some revenue in. Never mind. We started the year with 614 and we must got some revenue in. So now we're up to 656. Yep. Thank you. All right. May I have a motion and a second to approve the student activities account reauthorization? So moved. Moved by Member DeZoglio, second by Member Willett. Any discussion? Um, I have a question. How come, and I know you say that you cha they change so often, um, there, how come there's so many differences between all of the schools and 
um, like for instance, the marsh has chorus and marsh marsh music. Yeah. That that's up to the principals to request or request removal of. Um, I believe the CGS a couple of years ago asked to remove chorus because they they didn't need it or weren't using it. Yeah. And now they're it's reactivated uh, yeah. and now they want it back. So it's kind of a school by school um, what activities they're doing and it's kind of at the principal's request. And then do you know what the community programs? Community programs is the before and after school program. Um, oh. That's pretty much in there for uh, field trips over the summer um, so that they can uh, collect money, put it into that student activity and pay for field, tri field trips. And that's always, um, it's run out of the Timoney, so that's where that's, that account lives. Gotcha. Are there any other questions? Oh. And roll call, please, Martha. Ryan Zoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. May and Neil Perry? Yes. Thank you. Does the committee have any questions on the food services report? Done. Um, may I have a motion and a second to approve the FY24 Massachusetts School Buying Group Grocery Product Awarded to Dis Driscoll Foods, 6 West Belt Way, New Jersey, 07470. So moved. Second. Moved by Member Lett, second by Member DiZoglio. Discussion. Member Shabilia. I expected to see some kind of price list, product list, UPC something, and all I have is four pages of municipal legal. I, I will get you the bid doc that the, um, the group sent out. I'm imagining it's ex extremely ex expensive, but I will get that for you. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want a, a, a okay. book, you know what I mean? But I ex expected to see something, because right now it just says $300,000 on grocery products. Mm -hmm. Now, I get it. I was at Market Basket yesterday. I know it's not cheap. Right. But it doesn't tell me what we're looking to buy, and it's just... I'd gladly, I'd gladly get you more specifics for the next meeting. I, I have no issue with that. All right. Yeah, it's just municipal contracting is so vague. Yep. And it drives me a little bit crazy. Does it come with, do these contracts come with quality agreements? I mean, if we get a, a, I don't know, a box of heads of lettuce and, you know, 30% of the box is bad, are we able to send these things back? Yes. Like, yeah, that would all be in that packet because the they're, they're contracting not with us, but with, I, I believe it's like 37 different communities around the Boston area. So that's the buying group. And a GPO? They, yeah, they go, they go out to bid as a group to get the lowest price, and I'm sure they have those quality. All right. Yeah. Any other questions? Roll call. Ryan DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? I think I'm confused. Can I just vote present? You can yeah. do whatever you want. Okay. You just turn the mic off, though. Oh. Present. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. May and Neil Perry? No. Passes. Four yes, one no, one present. May I have a motion and a second to approve the FY24 Homeless Transportation Trip A awarded to Mar Trans Inc., 94 Newtonville Ave, Fitchburg, Mass., 01420 not to exceed $100,000. So moved. Second. Motion by Member Willette, second by Member Zizoglio. Any questions? Member Shabilia. So this is an amendment. Did the previous contract term out? Are we, are we just adding new locations? What exactly are we amending? I believe the, the original contract did not include certain things, such as uh, fingerprinting, et cetera. So we made sure that we added that. 
So none of these locations, the prices are changing? No. So we're paying $100,000 for fingerprinting? No, 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 no. $100,000 for the transportation. However, the contract didn't say anything about fingerprinting, so we, we just added that. Okay, so the old contract did expire. No, we just went out to bid. So we, we had a bunch of kids, and we have some in the Lawrence Lowell area, yep. and we have some others in Framingham, et cetera, kind of spread out. So we went out kind of an emergency bid because we needed the transportation um, rather quickly. Um, so we did emergency procurement with the IG's office guiding the way, and we sent out two bids. Those were the winners of the two bids. That's the estimated cost for the, those transportations, and we did amend it to add that they need to be fingerprinted, et cetera. This amendment is to the current contract. There's no, like, yeah, I'm not sure we're making, <coughs> making this clear for you all. There's no, nothing, I, this is not a company we've used for, this is a new contract for us, but we wanted to make sure that we included the fingerprinting part of this uh, for all the reasons I think the committee understands. And so we added that to both of them. We have another one in here that has the same amendment, Ms. Bozak. I just want to add that we have a current contract with NRT for homeless. However, they cannot meet our all needs. of our needs. So we had to go out to bid to identify other companies that could assist us. Right. Do they have 34 more buses? Unless I miss yes, right? The, no. the money that comes to Jesse is paying for this plus whatever we pay NRT for transportation of the homeless. That's what I was trying to Correct. say before. We'll be using that to offset yes. the, the vast majority of this transportation, yes. Thank you. So I, I know I'm going to start a fire here, but I apologize, Superintendent. So right. did we did we think of getting Martrans to bid the whole the whole thing, the whole deal? I just asked so, the same question. So Member Shabilia might have asked that somewhat quietly with his microphone off if they have 34 more buses, but uh, I don't believe they do. I think they're a smaller transportation company. They had the opportunity to bid for both. Yeah. Um, so they could have bid for both, and if they were the low, lowest bidder on both of them, they would have, they would have got both. Um, I'd have to go back and look to see if they did bid on the other one and just lost it. Um, but I don't think they have the number of vehicles necessary to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that as answer as well as the nice picture that look at the nice picture they put up of me. That's nice. That's beautiful. <laughs> oh yeah. <You're> top. <laughs> Roll call please. Brian Desaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Krista <clears throat> Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Yes. Unanimous. May I have a motion and a second to approve the FY24 Homeless Transportation Trip B Award to Big Lou Transportation, LLC, 35 Autumn Road, Rentham, Mass, so, 02093, not to exceed $100,000. So moved. Second. A motion by Member Willette, second by Member DeZoglio. That's the question, Dan. Does Big Lou have 34 buses? <laughs> <laughs> oh I am unsure at this point, but I do not believe they do. How could they be Big Lou if they don't have 34 <laughs> buses? It sounds like a small Lou to me. Good, good, yeah. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please, Martha. Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Yes. I just want to add one thing before we go on to the next thing, Madam Vice Chair. So, um, so this must be making your life incrementally more difficult for you, right? We're, we're piecemealing out, you know, to Martrans, the Big Lou, and then yes. obviously a piece to NRT, mm -hmm. right? But it, it must be kind of like, you know, trying to catch a monkey with a cup because you're looking at multiple different vendors providing basically the same service, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Wrong. okay. Yeah. All right. Does the committee have a nomination to fill the school s committee seat vacancy for the remainder of this school committee term due to the resignation of Vice Chair Luann Santos? Member DeZoglio. I nominate Laura, uh, Member Keegan. 
as the vice chair? Um, not yet. No. Oh, no. so move. <laughs> so move. I, I, yeah. Do you have a nomination to replace. Her? Replace. Yeah. This is to find a person to replace Luann. Oh. We need, a, we need oh, another person. Sorry. This is just discussion. Yeah. Right. So I think there is asks out. I hope that we have an answer. We need to have something scheduled for the 19th, as that'll be our 21 day, um, as was discussed with Attorney Macaro before he ran out of here after executive session. Um, I hope to have, I mean, we hope to have something. So. So nothing at this time. Nothing at this time, work in progress. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? No, I agree with what Member Shabilia said. Perfect. Wholeheartedly, right? Perfect. All right. Does the committee have any nominations to fill the vacancy of the vice chairperson? So, <laughs> so moved. You have to say so moved. Yeah. You, have you have to, to nominate. nominate someone. I nominate Madam uh, Keegan as the vice chair. Second. Discussion? Move the closing nomination process. Congratulations. Well, Oh, the member will let did it right, right? So we would have to ask if there are any other nominations. Oh. And then if there are none, you close the nomination process, right? I, so somebody else is interested, now is the time to say it. Are there any other nominations? No. All right, at this time, we'll close the nomination. So moved. Second. Moved by member Good. Willett, second by member Shabilia. Roll call vote. Hang on one second. Sorry to do this. So you have to be asked, and I'm sorry I'm not there. You have to be asked, are you willing to accept the nomination? No. Yes, I am. Okay. All right, now go ahead. Roll call. This is to close the nominations, correct? correct. Yep. Ryan Salvio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Present. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willette? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. Five yes, one present, it passes. To close the nomination. So now we need a subsequent roll call vote because we've already nominated you and you've accepted. Okay. No, it's not. <laughs> um, can I get a roll call vote for a motion to appoint the mo Member oh, Keegan oh. as vice chair. Got it. So I need a motion and a second to already appoint. Did it. No, no, we, we did already that. did that. We just doing so a we need now vote. the roll call vote yeah, just a roll to call appoint yeah. Laurie Keegan as vice chair. Ryan DiZaglio? Yes. Laurie Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? No. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. Five yes, one no, passes. Mm -hmm. Move down two chairs. Um, now we need a motion and a second for any, no, does the committee have any nominations to fill the vacancy of the secretary that has now just been vacated? Madam Chair would nominate Member Shabilia for secretary if he accepts it. I would second that. I accept. Are there any other nominations? No. Then I need. Motion to close the nomination process. Um, second. Um, <laughs> and I need a roll call vote to close the nominations. Brian DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. May Neil Perry? Yes. Right. And now we need a roll call vote to appoint Member Shabilia as the secretary. Ryan DiZaglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Kristen Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Willett? Yes. May Neil Perry. Yes. Unanimous. Good job.
You're here. All right. Is there a policy subcommittee update? So no, the policy subcommittee has not met yet. Um, while waiting to schedule, which we will be scheduling this week for sometime next week, I did look into MASCs because I was there chatting the course on Saturday in Chicopee. Um, they offer a policy review and rewrite service um, where MASC will come in for, it's, it's a little over 10 grand, but it's $3,500 a year for three years and they will rewrite everything. So that's what I intend to bring forth at the first policy meeting. So hopefully my, our next update will be what comes from that conversation. Excellent, thank you. Are there any questions? Is there a residency subcommittee update? Um, we haven't uh, met due to the fact that I was waiting for um, formal um, com member um, Santos to join. But I will be talking to um, Dr. Kwong, uh, meeting with Mr. F uh, Officer Fleming. Um, I'll be sending an email out to the committee members to see what any concerns they have on residency uh, to me to bring towards the subcommittee. And so where I can work on focus areas where we can improve. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Does one person substitute a proper subcommittee? You can. You can't? I don't know. I'm legitimately. I yeah, I know you, you can't just have one member. Okay. But if anybody wants to join, obviously. Oh, I've already thrown myself on two of them. Yeah. So. Um, that's why I'm also, um, the, the matter obviously that because I'm one member, um, that's why I will be sending out emails to you guys to see what questions you have, uh, with residency. So I can then focus on that areas. So when I do bring it back to the committee, nobody's like shocked. It's, it's to answer your questions as well. Um, but that's the thing is just scheduling who we can get into the subcommittee um, and making sure everybody's located uh, and talk about the issues. Um, I just want to remind you that any subcommittee meeting that you have, you Has, have to post it yeah, 48, 48 hours, hours in advance, um, et cetera. So yep. um, if you're meeting with people, just remember that that's considered a subcommittee meeting. Yeah. All right, is there a transportation subcommittee update? Yes, transportation subcommittee met last week. I don't remember what day it was offhand. Tuesday. Um, yeah, thank you. Long story short, we are looking at options on how to encourage corrective action with NRT. Um, hopefully more to come on that soon. Um, is there any other business from the committee? All right, with no further business to discuss, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn the business workshop meeting of March 11th, 2024? So, so moved. moved. Moved by Member Chevillia, second by Member DiZoglio. Um, discussion? And roll call vote, please. Ryan DiZoglio? Yes. Lori Keegan? Yes. Krista Maxwell? Yes. Daniel Shabilia? Yes. Kenneth Ouellette? No. Oh. May and Neil Perry? Yes. All right, the meeting is adjourned at 9.12 p.m. Good night, Methuen.